LeeTDickey.com. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Lee Dickey here. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. Today, we continue the Star Wars miniseries with my guest, Alex Kirsch of the 365 Broadcasting Network. Now, Alex hosts two shows on the 365 Broadcasting Network, Depth of Perspective, which is a political show, and Not Your Normal Entertainment Review, which, as you guessed, is an entertainment-centered show. So go check those out. Links in the description. But I loved having Alex on the show to discuss Star Wars. We talked everything from the Disney takeover, his favorite films, favorite characters, where his love for the franchise and this Star Wars juggernaut, or the Lucasfilms juggernaut, began and why he thinks Boba Fett is so popular. All that and more right here on this brand new episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast and a new episode within the Star Wars miniseries right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast. But before we get into the main event, before we get into the real salt and pepper of this show, I want to tell you where you can find me and the Beats and Speaks podcast. You can find me on social media at Lee T. Dickey on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Links will be in the description. You can find the Beats and Speaks podcast on my official website, LeeTDickey.com, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and wherever your favorite podcasts are available. Please do like, comment, share, subscribe, and rate us five stars because that helps us raise in the rankings and helps me provide you guys more content, which is something I really love to do. I love to do this show, and that helps us gain more listeners and grow this fan base within the Beats and Speaks podcast. So please rate us five stars, like us, comment, share, and subscribe. We're also on YouTube as well under Lee Dickey TV. Of course, all those links will be in the description. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast, please email me at Lee T. Dickey. That's L-E-I-G-H. T-D-I-C-K-E-Y at gmail.com and we can set something up so you and I can share a Wi-Fi connection and have a good old-fashioned conversation and you can hear yourself and find yourself on a future episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. But now that all that housekeeping is out of the way, let's get into the real salt and pepper, into the main event, my interview with Alex Kirsch right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast, a new episode within this Star Wars miniseries right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast. So here we go. Hi, this is Alex Kirsch, and you're listening to the Beats and Speeds podcast with Lee Dickey. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined this week on the Beats and Speeds podcast by Alex Kirsch, I think. Did I say that right? That is correct. Alex Kirsch. He is from Georgia, and we are here today to talk all about Star Wars. So, Alex Kirsch, before we get into this giant Star Wars episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. Why don't you tell my audience a little bit about you and who you are? Not a problem. Uh, my name is Alex, as he had told you, and I'm 36 years old. I currently live in Columbus, Georgia, and I have two podcasts. One of the podcasts I've been doing since January, it's called Depth of Perspective. It is a political podcast and also talks about society issues of today. But I also have an entertainment podcast, which I just started. It is called uh, Not Your Normal Entertainment Review or short for Niner. You can usually find my podcast on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 365 Broadcasting. Cool. I mean, a, a man after my own heart. I'm a dual podcaster myself. I, I don't only do this show. I do a pro wrestling show, a uh, pinfall, a pro wrestling podcast is the wow. other one. I actually have to come up with a new way to produce them both since I am only one man and I only have two arms and two legs and one mind, I hope, that I haven't lost. <laughs> yeah, but um, let's get into why we're here. We're here to talk Star Wars, and you reached out to me because I think I had put out a call for guests because I was looking for guests to talk about Star Wars, and you kindly sent me an email, and we set this whole thing up a couple of weeks ago. And why don't you tell me and tell my audience like where your fandom of Star Wars starts? Well, my fandom of Star Wars all started back when I was just a kid. I think I remember I was on a trip with my parents and my sister, and I think The Return of the Jedi was on. But I've always been a huge science fiction geek since then, since I was a child, actually. 
that's essentially where it all started. And I remember w- when they did the special edition or the uh, newer special effects in uh, 1996 or 7, I think it was. And I went and saw A New Hope in theaters. And I was com- – I, even though I would seen it at least 100 times, I was still blown away by how incredible the special effects were. And uh, ever since then, I've always been a bit of a Star Wars geek. I've played uh, Star Wars video games, uh, whether it was Knights of the Republic 1 and 2, or I played Battlefield. I played – all of them, you know, and I, and I had a great time doing them. So uh, even though I would have to say I'm more of a Star Trek person myself, actually, but I still love Star Wars. Don't get me wrong. Like getting back to the video games for a second, because I tried myself to get into Star Wars, and I, I'm still trying. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's just a little bit of Stockholm syndrome where I'm like, I'll eventually love it. Eventually, I, I have no idea. I, I will eventually fall in love with it, or it will eventually kill me. I don't know. Yeah, But um, when it came to the video games, I can't remember which one it was, but I know it was on the Nintendo 64. And I asked my dad to buy it for me, and he did. I can't remember whether it was a Christmas gift or a birthday gift or it was just a one-off sort of, here you go, kid, have fun. Yeah. I remember him looking at me, and he's like, you're probably not going to like it. I'm like, well, why would you say that? He's like, you don't like Star Wars. <laughs> you just don't <laughs> like it. You, you're more of a, and he was right, because I was more of a Star Trek guy, and I still am to this day. I love yeah. Star Trek. But um, when it comes to Star Wars, I don't know whether it was I couldn't get a, a grip of the source material or I didn't um, sort of connect with the character. As uh, another guest that I interviewed uh, earlier had uh, asked me whether I connected with the character, and I really couldn't tell him that I did. Because yeah. Truthfully, I, I don't think I ever have. But is, yeah. there, is there a character within Star Wars that you really sort of gravitated towards or connect, connected to? I would have to say there's no real character that I really connected to. Like, I, I just kind of looked at all the characters had their specific purpose. I mean, everybody loves R2. People love C-3PO. Some people love Chewbacca. I don't know. I, I've never really connected with any one character. But if there is one that I would actually say is actually relatable, would actually – um. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, though. That's kind of a real, real tough question to ask or answer, actually, because like I've I've never really s- spotted or said, well, there's one character I really connect to as well. I j- I kind of like just all of them, to be perfectly honest. Well, let me let me ask you about a character who gets limited screen time but somehow is incredibly popular. Send it, Boba Fett. Oh God, everybody loves Boba Fett. Everybody does, but he's got such limited screen time. But why do you think he's so popular? It's all about the backstory that he has. It's all about, like, the lore that is involved with uh, Boba Fett. I mean, for crying out loud, the guy's got a jetpack. He's chasing down Han Solo. You see very, very little about him, but I think it's just the mystery behind him and that people are actually driven to him just because of the lore that there is behind him. That's why people like him. People are driven to somebody that is completely unknown. I mean, we learn all about Luke, we learn about Leia, we learn about Chewbacca, we learn about Darth Vader, but nobody knows anything about Boba Fett. Why is this guy so awesome? How is he so mysterious? Why is he so mysterious? And, you know, you kind of get a little bit about that in the prequels. You kind of learn about his origins, but it's the lore that goes deeper into detail that people actually take the time to study because that's what makes a character rememberable. Or it is like if you're willing to dig deep and look further into – the origins of the character, why he came to be, how did he become such a good bounty hunter? I mean, that's why people are so drawn to him. That's why you see, like, uh, bumper stickers, uh, the Mandalorian symbol. You'll see that all over the place because of Boba Fett, essentially. All right. We've, we've delved into why Boba Fett is as popular as he is. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned um, A New Hope earlier. Yes. And they remastered that, I think, in 97, or at least had remastered yeah. effects um, for its, I guess, re-release in theaters. Yeah. And I, that, I suppose, led into the prequels. Yes. Um, uh, the Phantom Menace, the Attack of the Clones, and then Revenge of the Sith, I think, was the last one in the prequels. Yes. Or at least from, what I, from what Wikipedia tells me, because I'm not yeah. even going to deny it, folks. Wikipedia solves all my problems when it comes to these podcasts. When you saw, say like the remastered or re-release of A New Hope. I can't even remember. I think at that time I might have been like eight or nine years old. Was there like any talk of like the prequels coming at all? 
I don't remember. I just remember uh, 98 was when The Phantom Menace came, came out. And I initially wanted to see that, but then I actually opted to watch The Blair Witch Project instead. <laughs> well, did you enjoy The Blair Witch Project? Hell no, I thought it was horrible. But it's okay, The Phantom Menace was horrible too. <laughs> I Well, yeah, that was the thing. I mean, I could tell you a quick story about The Phantom Menace. At least I, I think it was The Phantom Menace. It may have been uh, Attack of the Clones, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. I remember that my my sister was visiting my parents and I. Yeah. And she really loves uh, Star Wars, like any okay. sort of like sci-fi. She loves that stuff. And I, at that time, and even to this day, I really can't even wrap my mind around it. I'm trying to gain an appreciation, folks, okay? I promise. Yeah. Back then, I think I might have been... I, the Phantom Menace came out, I was like 10, and I think Attack of the Clones came out, I'm like 13, somewhere mm-hmm. in there. Yeah. So we go to the theater, and we had to co- we basically had to compromise. So my dad went with my sister to see, I think it was The Phantom Menace. And I went with my mom to see something else. I don't remember what it was that my mom and I saw, but we uh, basically my dad and sister went to see whatever Star Wars film was in the theater at the time, and my mom and I went to see whatever we saw. Yeah. So... What happened was, because the Star Wars films tend to last a whole year when they're in the theater, yep. I mean, like airing-wise, you're going to be a, a whole year older by the time you leave the cinema, because they are rather long. Our movie, my mother my mother and I's movie wrapped up early. It ran, sh- well, it, not that it ran short, it was just a shorter film. Yeah. So we, we left the auditorium that we were in, and we couldn't find uh, my dad or my sister. Yeah. So... My mom and I walked up to this attendant that works in the theater, and we basically explained, like, look, you know, I'm looking for my dad, or my mom was like, I'm looking for my husband and my sister and what have you. And the the attendant sort of, like, gritted his teeth. He said, look, I'm not supposed to do this, but if you don't tell anybody, have at it, right? Like we And we snuck into basically whatever Star Wars movie was playing at the time, yeah. which is where my dad and sister were. Yep. And even for like the 20 minutes, <laughs> that's um, the 20 or 30 minutes that I saw, I, I really just didn't get the draw or the the appeal. So yeah. what do you think? What do you think the appeal or the draw of Star Wars is? The story, obviously, um, because it take uh, what was it? A New Hope, right? You're learning about this. Uh, for I remember, like during the making of. Star Wars A New Hope, right? When George Lucas actually sat in on a screening, as soon as the first scene rolls over and it's the rebel ship that's escaping from the Empire, everybody already knew who the bad guy was. Everybody just knew it, right? There was no backstory behind it except like the the rolling screen and things like that, but everybody already knew who it was. And then you first meet Darth Vader, you meet Leia, you meet C-3PO, R2-G2, you meet all these people. Then you meet the protagonist, you meet Luke Skywalker, and then he goes on this adventure with Obi-Wan Kenobi. I mean, it's just – but then, like, it, you see Empire Strikes Back, then you watch The Return of the Jedi, and you're like, well, what about the origins of everybody else? What about the origins of Darth Vader? How did he get bad? That was just the appeal of seeing – where did everything go so horribly wrong? I think that's one of the biggest things that – because Darth Vader has been rated one of the greatest antagonists in cinematic history, actually. I think he's like two or three or something like that because Hannibal Lecter is number one, unless they've changed it recently. But it's just because he's got such a riveting backstory. I think that's why people went and saw The Phantom Menace, why people saw Attack of the Clones, and why people watched uh, Revenge of the Sith because it's that, it's that, it's that, um, that story. That's just building up, building up, building it, and now everything makes sense. Well, that's a fair point. I mean, I, I would agree with Darth Vader being probably, like, right up there in terms of, like, the greatest movie antagonist of all time, even though I have, I've barely seen any of the, uh, the films or even read any of the source material. Yeah. How do you feel about Lucas, like, George Lucas basically selling out to Disney for four and a half billion dollars and how they like what they've done to the series uh first off i'm envious of george lucas to be able to sell for four billion dollars that's my first statement there yeah Um, i mean if if anybody if anybody if anybody gave me that kind of money and said here go away now like yeah (laughs) sure no no problem 
Well, here's the thing. Here, here's the problem, though, is that I feel like at times they are trying to do too much. Like they're trying to appeal to everybody. I mean, the thing is, is when it comes down to the story, right? Yes, you want to make it comfortable for children to sit through. But the thing is, it's a very riveting story, and it's not necessarily meant for children. I mean, I, of course, that's kind of a terrible thing to say, actually. I, I'd have to retract that statement. The thing is, I think they were trying to do too much. Like, for instance, when they created a Jar Jar Binks and the Gungans, it was one of the dumbest ideas I've ever seen because they were probably the most annoying species I've ever seen ever in a science fiction story. I think they just threw them in there just for the comedic factor, which I thought was unfortunate because it was completely unnecessary. I think they put the movies into the wrong people's hands, and they tried to do too much, especially in the prequels. Phantom Menace, uh, Attack of the Clones, and The Revenge of the Sith, they tried way too hard with them. And it wasn't until J.J. Abrams took the reins again where he started to bring the story back, which the story is the most important part when it comes to a movie or a TV series. That's what's most important. The substance. To me, substance is one of the most important things in a movie or a story. Again, fair point. I would agree with you. For anybody to get engrossed in any sort of TV show, movie, whatever, anything that has to do with entertainment, like even you know a podcast like this, there has to be a story. Sure. So, but I mean, with the rise of Skywalker coming out at the end of the year. I'm assuming you're going to go see it, but are you going to go see it from a fan's perspective or just from the perspective of it's a Star Wars film, I have to see it? Both. Are you, uh, both. You're looking forward to it, I assume. I am, but I've, I was really disappointed with The Last Jedi. I was extremely disappointed because, like, they did so much. It's like they were trying to jam too much of one story into one movie, and I felt they were trying to try too hard with it, honestly. Because, like, the thing is, I, when I went and saw The Force Awakens, I didn't know what I was walking into. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, though, is, like, they really focused on the story. They focused on the backstory of the people. And it kind of drew you in to learn more about them. You didn't know the origins of Rey. You didn't know anything about Finn. But yet you connected with them. And the reason why I liked it, though, is because it was kind of going back to what it means to tell a Star Wars story, what makes it so important. I mean, granted, there are some plot holes in it, but every movie has some plot holes in it. But it's like The Last Jedi, I was like, what, that, that's it? I was expecting something a little bit more. And there was like a lot of unnecessary dialogue, a lot of unnecessary plot gaps. It was just like, what, what are you guys trying to do exactly? It, everything was pretty predictable, and I, I was really disappointed with it, actually. So it basically came off almost like a, a fart in church. Not really a fart in church. It was more of like the, you know, uh, the squeak in church kind of deal. Fair. Please don't sue me, Disney, by the way. No, nah, they can't sue uh, you. <laughs> I know that the one thing that draws me in, because I'm a musician and entertainer myself, is John Williams' music, his score for the film. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, that would draw me in. What's your take on John Williams and his musical prowess within the film because I know he's done Home Alone, he's done Superman, obviously he's done Star Wars and a whole host load of others. So give me your take on John Williams. If a if a movie has a really bad musical score, you're going to lose I'm going to lose interest really quickly. That musical score has got to be riveting. I'll give an example. It's not a Star Wars example. Uh The Last of the Mohicans, right? The Promontory song. That mm -hmm. is it, I feel like I'm a part of the action right there. It's got that folk sound to it. And it's got that old-timey sound to it, and you feel like you're a part of the action. And the same thing with John Williams with Star Wars, right? Especially like when they're uh, in A New Hope, where they're taking on the Star, uh, the the uh, Death Star, right? You just hear that music in the background, the brass instruments in the background. You feel like you're in the action, and you just feel like you're in it to win it kind of deal. You can just feel the the power, you know, all the way around the board. I mean, it's so important to have a strong musical score to go along with it because if it doesn't it's just going to fall flat and no one's going to get excited about it it's like uh okay i i suppose i'm supposed to be happy about this almost like kevin costner in Waterworld. you know it's not going to do well yeah i mean i i completely agree with you and like john williams is probably like one of my favorite composers of anybody you know that's, that's composed music or mm -hmm. anybody that's worked on a star wars film i think i'd be more interested to basically just have a day with him and just pick his brain about certain things as to how oh, he 
he goes about composing. I mean, Danny Elfman, too, by the way. Oh, yeah. But, or uh, Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer's great, yeah, too. There's a, yeah, I think he did Hans Zimmer. Like, I know we're getting slightly off topic. I think he did um, the Simpsons movie. And he's, he's done a whole host load of others. I mean... Well, he's doing the I, upcoming Dune movie. Is he? Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, I suppose... Some rapid fire that I want to get into with you a little bit. If you spend could it. spend a day with a character or anyone on production or like an actor or an actress or even in the, you know, in terms of like putting the movies and franchises, the franchise together, who would it be? I've, I'm going to have to go with J.J. Abrams because he's a fan like us. Aside from him being a fan, why else would you want to? Is there any other reason you'd want to pick his brain or like just shadow him for a day well it's because he knows like he knows what makes his story good every movie i've seen him do he's done star trek and he's done star wars he he grabs the essence of wit makes them believable he's i'd say one of the sole reasons as to why some of these movies have been so successful and it's because he has that drive and he has that passion and he has that love for these stories which is something that most directors are failing to capture nowadays they're just out there for the quick buck. But, of course, it's the inter entertainment industry. They're out there to make the most money that they possibly can, and I'm not going to fault them for it. But it, to me, it's just like if you don't invest your heart and soul into the movie or the story, I can tell. It's just – to me, it's just – it's useless. It's kind of like watching uh, Transformers Age of Extinction again. There's nothing there. It is just an empty movie with a huge CGI budget. That's it, and I hate it too. Well, isn't like, that what – that's what most movies are these days anyway. Of course giant cgi money pits yeah i mean it, it's unfortunate though too so okay you'd re you'd spend a day with jj abrams i mean i, yep. I can't i can't fault that i remember i think i might it was either a documentary i'd seen or like a tv special or i had heard something <laughs> where sort of like the nucleus of the whole star wars universe if you want to call it that or franchise it basically stemmed from Lucas pitching the the franchise, but pitching it as, as an old-timey Western film set in outer space. Thinking about somebody, like, pitching it back and say, I, don't, I think he might have pitch, pitched it in, like, the early 70s, early to mid-70s, because the first one didn't come out until, what, 77, I think? I think that's what it was, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he pitches it to Fox and knocks down his director fee yeah. to like, like $150,000. Yeah. But the deal he negotiates, how they, went, how they went for this, and whoever his lawyer or agent is or was back then, mm -hmm. I want to know who they are, simply because he knocks his director fee down, but he negotiates a deal to where he can keep all the merchandising fees. Yeah. Like all the rights, which is genius. Oh yeah, but it wasn't expected to succeed though. Like this was expect this movie was expected to tank at the box office. Like nobody thought this movie was gonna be good. Like every other place he went to, right, where uh, he wanted to promote this movie, they all turned him down because this is nope, this isn't gonna work. I, I I can't I can't do a movie like this. And you know, as soon as that movie hit theaters, they were all kicking themselves on the rear end, especially 20th Century Fox because you know. All the merchandising fees, that was huge. Good God, yeah. there was so much merchandise being sold. Like, that guy made so much off of merchandise alone. I mean, he, he could have retired after the first movie, and he would have been set for life. Yeah, but, I mean, think about it. Disney gave him $4.5 billion and said, go away, and he went, yeah, all right. Like, well, of course, yeah. He's, he, he's stuck with it for so long that they're just like, how do we get rid of him? Give, yeah. him, a lot of, give him a lot of money. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's just give him a ton. Absolutely. And it worked hell. It would work with me, to be honest with you. If I had a successful franchise and they were like, oh, yeah. we want to give you a ton and like you can retire. Yes, sir. Please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Right. You were engrossed with these as a kid and you're a bit older than I am. So and I have to ask, did you ever get into the, the Kenner figures at all? Because I know they were big into the toy line. I don't think I ever did. No. <laughs> did you uh, did you ever want to? Like, was there anything? Did you see anything in terms of like commercials or things in the stores when you were a kid you're just like i really wanted that 
there were so many different things that I wanted as a kid when it came down to toys, action figures, and things like that. Um, those ones, I just never really thought about it, actually, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Were, so I'm assuming, like, were you more of a G.I. Joe kind of a... Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles normally was one of my things, but I was also a dinosaur fiend. Uh, nice. Like, uh, growing up, I was a... I wanted to be an archaeologist, a paleontologist, I mean, because I, I knew everything there was to know about dinosaurs back in the day, and I still have a pretty good knowledge about it, but not as much as I used to. Yeah. But, um, I think it was just because I was more all about dinosaurs. And then growing up, it was like Godzilla, but I think Star Trek I was more into, uh, growing up, because... I went to a uh, convention up in Portland, Oregon, mm. where I'm originally from, right. is Oregon, and I was just completely blown away by the technology that was involved in Star Trek and the characters. I mean, I, I loved it, you know, and it's just there, there was so much I could relate to more, but as far as Star Wars goes, I mean, I loved watching, but like once I actually started playing the video games is when I was like really getting into it then. What video game that was centered around Star Wars really sort of drew you in? It's got to be the Knights of the Old Republic because I love the RPG concept of creating your own character and creating your own destiny. I love that idea. I mean, it's just – I love forging my own path when it comes to a video game. I mean, my all-time favorite game series is Mass Effect. That's my that's my stuff right there. <laughs> but, like, uh, I love Knights of the Old Republic more than any other Star Wars video game. When did that come out? Probably, like, in the early – was that sometime in the 90s or early 2000s? Oh, no, early 2000s. Uh, early see, 2000s, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. like, um, at one point I, when I played, uh, I would play at my cousin's house, mm -hmm. and we would play uh, Star Wars uh, games there, and we'd grab the cheat codes and whatnot, and we'd unlock different characters, and we would play those games. I mean, they were fun, don't get me wrong. But you, probably was, spent a, you probably spent a lot of money on, like, ink and printer paper, though. Oh, yeah, well. Back, back uh, in those days. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, my Aunt Kathy actually got me a subscription to a, a video game mag magazine that had all the cheat codes, so we just used those. Cool. Shout out to Aunt Kathy. Oh, yeah. You mentioned the video games that really got you into it. But it, can you sort of return to a moment in time within, like, the movies that kind of just spoke to you? Oh, absolutely. The Empire Strikes Back. I consider it the best of the all... Uh, all the in movies, and it's because like it, it didn't occur to me until now recently to why that movie is so important. Because you know, for those who haven't seen it, spoiler alert: <laughs> um, Luke is very impatient, right? When it mm -hmm. comes down to it, he's very impatient about becoming a Jedi, and he and it's not until Yoda reveals himself to him that he's like, "Oh crap, I just screwed up in front of the boss, in front of the guy that's like the subject matter expert." And you know, Yoda is just you know trying to mentor Luke and try to teach him. I mean, and just try to teach him how uh, it is. And it, it's one of the most pivotal parts of the movie series, actually. And, you know, he's talking about how, you know, I am an ally with the Force. And a powerful ally it is life makes it grow. Uh, life creates it, makes it grow. And it's like you have to feel the Force within you, between you, the tree, the rock, stuff like that. And it's just like he really just tries so hard to teach Luke. But Luke is just like, ah, you know, he – cares more about his friends than actually learning about what it means to be a Jedi. And I think it's just so pivotal. And, you know, that that just kind of just draws you in and you learn so much more and how he learns more about himself, you know. That's that typical um, sort of, grow, you know, going from a, a child to an adolescent to an adult sort of a deal, I guess, within movie or cinematic oh, sure. form. Yeah. But it's great because it, it it's also the point where the bad guy wins in that movie. And sometimes it's Sometimes it's important to be humbled by that because sometimes you need, you know, a real slap in the face to kind of wake up, which is why the Return of the Jedi took place, you know, because you look at the Empire. They're the most powerful force in the galaxy, and they're just wiping out all other resistance right there, and it's just, you know, you have to see them win. You can't just expect them to be the most powerful force, and yet they can't hit the broadside of a barn like a stormtrooper can't. <laughs> um, this is, like, last question here. And it might be a loaded one. I don't know. But do Go you think L Loda it, or Loda? I'm, I'm, words are hard today, folks. Gotcha. Um, but do you think Yoda is the greatest teacher? That's a tough question, actually. Um, he's the original teacher. I think it's because he'd been doing it for so long. He just knew, and he'd probably seen every single student you can possibly imagine. I would say he was a very consistent teacher and mentor. 
but the thing is he had seen certain people of uh, the the was it the light side of the force and the dark side of the force because nobody ever starts on the dark side they usually go to the other side usually and usually tempted by it usually at, at least that's what from what i understand but it's kind of a tough question actually i would say he's not the toughest he's just the most consistent probably fair point so i mean uh alex thank you for coming on the show and enlightening me and enlightening my audience sure. here on the Be- beats and speaks podcast on your fandom and love for star wars i think we all learned something and i i know i did for me oh, not yeah. being like the biggest fan in the world but i i appreciate your time and appreciate you taking the time today to to do this and thank you sir i'm sure we will catch you down, down the road but if oh, you absolutely. want to the floor is yours tell my audience and tell everybody listening where they can find you uh, you can find me at 365 Broadcasting uh, on Facebook, and you can find it on uh, YouTube. You'll have to type in uh, The Big Sarge Show because uh, the network is run by uh, Big Sarge himself. Once again, I go live on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just go over to The Big Sarge Network. If you don't want to get involved in politics but entertainment stuff, just be on the lookout for when I do a entertainment review or uh, Not Your Normal Entertainment Review, also known as Niner. I'll always take suggestions, but I like to talk about everything when it comes to movies, reviews, uh, whether it's science fiction or drama, action. I'll talk about books. I'll talk about movies, video games, all of it. That's where I – because that's my passion right there. It's right in your wheelhouse. So, Alex, thank you again. That has thank been you. my guest, Alex Kirsch. Again, find him and his podcast on your favorite platform. Alex, again, thank you so, so much. I'm sure we will see you and catch you down the road, my friend. Certainly. Absolutely. Thanks All for right, having bro. me on. Yeah, you're welcome. You have All a good right. one, sir, and we will talk to you soon. Well, there it is, and there you have it. My interview with Alex Kirsch of the 365 Broadcasting Network, talking all about Star Wars right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast. Alex, thank you again for reaching out and coming on the show and wanting to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you on, a real pleasure to go back and forth with you and talk about your love for the Lucasfilms juggernaut. Now, if you want to find... Alex and his two shows on the 365 Broadcasting Network. I will post as many links as I can find in the description below. Again, Alex hosts two shows on the 365 Broadcasting Network, Depth of Perspective, which is a political show, and Not Your Normal Entertainment Review, which, as you guessed, is an entertainment-centered podcast. Both of those shows and as many links as I can find will be down in the description below, so go check those out. Alex, thank you again. And if you ever want to come back on, please do just reach out. My inbox is always open and my door is always on. Or my door is always open and my inbox is always on. Depending on which way the coin flips and what side of the coin you're looking at it from. Either way, you're always welcome back here. So thank you again for coming on the show. Now to find brand new episodes of the Beats and Speaks podcast, please go to my official website, leetdicky.com, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Please do comment, like, share, and subscribe. We're also on YouTube under Lee Dickey TV. Of course, all those links will be in the description. If you'd like to be a future guest right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast, please do email me at leetdickey at gmail.com. Please do like and rate us five stars on your favorite podcast app and player of choice because that only helps us give you new content and give you new stories, give you new interviews, and it just helps out a whole hell of a lot. We raise in the rankings and we bring you along with us, so please do rate us five stars on your favorite podcast app and player of choice. If you'd like to review the show, please do that as well on your favorite podcast app and player of choice. You can also leave reviews on my official Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Lee T. Dickey, and my official website, the Beats and Speaks landing page, specifically on my official website, where you can leave reviews under your favorite episode of choice, and I will feature them right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast, as well as front and center right there on my official website, LeeTDickey.com. But that wraps up another episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast, and another episode within the Star Wars miniseries right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast. Thank you all for listening. Please comment, like, share, and subscribe. Find us everywhere. All those links will be in the description. Check out my guest, Alex Kirsch, and his two shows on the 365 Broadcasting Network. But until next time, have a good one, and we'll talk to you soon. Lee Dickey, signing off. Peace. (laughs) 